All right, my uh, message to you today is a very, very simple one with two components to it. Uh, one reflects a little bit of uh, a lot of what the former speakers have been saying, which, uh, and that is that there is a conservation crisis in Africa. And the second component of it then is a, a, what I hope will be a message of hope, but that is something that requires action and uh, some fairly urgent action. I'd like to start by uh, just using an example of one of the parks that we've been running now for about 10 years. It's a, it's a small park in Malawi called Majeti. Uh, I doubt that too many of you have, uh, have heard of it. Majeti is uh, 70,000 hectares. 10, 11 years ago, when we started managing the park, it had absolutely nothing left in it. The rhinos had been wiped out in the 1970s. The elephants, 300 of them, had been wiped out by the 1980s and everything else by the turn of the century. It didn't receive a single visit to the park. It had 12 people that were employed in it, being paid on average every six months. There was no infrastructure, and uh, local people were cutting the timber in the park for, for charcoal and for resettlement purposes. So for all intents and purposes, Majeti was lost uh, to Malawian society and uh, to the global conservation community. Twelve years later, after a whole lot of effort and, uh, and quite some money, Majeti now is a completely different kettle of fish. So every single species that should have been in Majeti has been reintroduced. We've put back over 300 elephants, black rhino. We've reintroduced the predators and all other species, again, that are important for uh, the functioning ecosystem. There are about 250 people that are employed in the park. All the infrastructure has been built. There are roads, telecommunications. The park is fenced, necessarily, necessarily so, because it has a, a very hard boundary with people, and you can't bring elephants and lions back into an area and have them impact on people, so the park has been fenced. We have three different uh, uh, tourism operations. Uh, Robin Pope Safaris have invested in the park, uh, and uh, there are two other operations. We receive 7,000 visitors a year to Majeti, and uh, the park generates now about uh, $400,000 of income, which contributes to the conservation costs. So what I'd like to do is to use Majeti as an example to, to illustrate both what the problem was and why we end up with that, and a little bit about what we see as a potential solution. So, this is a, a map of Africa. This is the opportunity. Af Africa, as uh, some of you know, is not completely covered in wild animals with these vast expanses. The areas that are in green, unfortunately, the only ones that you can see are about bigger than 70,000 hectares. So, it doesn't show up on the map if it's smaller than that. But for ecosystem services to happen at a level that we as a species are dependent on, it needs to happen at a certain scale. And this is what is there, at least in terms of the IUCN database. We know a lot of these areas in practice, a lot of them don't exist. We call them paper parks. Um, and uh, unfortunately, far too many of them are that. But that is what the official opportunity uh, is that we're looking at. There are 1,200 national parks or protected areas in Africa. To put that into perspective, in terms of museums, there are 17,500 museums in the U.S. alone, and I think 19,100 and something in Europe. Museums are important, but they typically preserve the past. We're talking here about protecting the areas that we as a species are dependent on. So, the typical things that I think you've, you've heard from some of the other speakers as what's been happening, and these are just a couple of slides that uh, show what's uh, happened over the last century and a half. Uh, sorry, this is, is uh, okay, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'm going to skip this section because it doesn't seem to be working in terms of the range and the shrinking of the range. But basically what these slides show is a, a shrinking of the habitat. Are we on the right computer, sorry? I don't think we are. Okay, it doesn't matter. So in terms of the shrinkage of the habitat, you've heard the story of the lions, you've heard the story of the elephants. Uh, just to put some of those statistics into, into pers uh, perspective, 35,000 elephants represents uh, just under 10% of the continent's elephant population. Elephants only grow when they're left alone and they've got the habitat. They only grow at about 5 to 6%. 
So when you're losing 9 to 10% of your elephants in the year, you've got a problem. Similar situation with lion. Sorry, these don't. I'm going to flip through these because it doesn't show anything. Um, so the lion situation we've lost in the 17 countries across the north of Africa have got four populations of lion left, totaling about 150 animals. Lion is a, the the uh, lion conservation is a crisis in Africa. If you look at your, your habitat, your forests, your savannas, uh, the, the, the wetlands of Africa, they are being lost at such an incredibly alarming rate. And those are the very, the systems, the, the, the reservoirs of biodiversity, the lungs of the earth. Uh, if I could have shown you this particular uh, setting here, if that was lung cancer in an individual, they would have died within one second of this transition, uh, going to show what's happened in literally just 10 years. And this is what's happening to the key habitats of, uh, of, of Africa. But I think it's important to understand what are the drivers of those uh, different losses. We've, we've heard a, a lot about the ivory and the rhino horn, and those are incredibly important. We lump those together as what we call the commodities, high-value commodities. It goes to other things like sandalwood, perlamoon. Uh, there are a whole range of different commodities that people extract um, uh, because of the value that's in them. By the way, nearly all of those don't have any local value. They're only value to external markets, which is an important determinant. But it's not just those. So if, if China stopped all importation of rhino horn and ivory today, Africa would still have a conservation crisis. And it's very important to be able to understand why. The energy needs of the people of Africa are being supplied to a large extent through, through charcoal through the cutting of trees and the production of charcoal. Tanzania as a country has 87% of its energy comes out of charcoal. In Malawi, 80% of all charcoal has been harvested from the protected areas and the, and the forest reserves of the country. So you're having a, a massive habitat loss because of the requirements for energy. In terms of protein, we all need protein to be able to survive. And local people are harvesting protein where that protein is available. So it's whether it's fishing in, in rivers using mosquito nets, uh, whether it is uh, poaching for bush meat, uh, it's, it's happening across the continent. And then likewise, things like alternative land use. I've just come back from Ethiopia. Ethiopia is a country of 85 million people. In the crisis of the 1980s, there were 35 million people. The population of Ethiopia that has a 97% conversion rate, so only 3% of the country is unmodified, where do you put an extra 3 million people per year in a country like that? So whether that land use is for agriculture, for, for, uh, for settlement, uh, for mining, whether it's large scale or whether it's small scale, the different land uses of Africa uh, are having a massive impact on these conservation areas. If we look forward, as a, as a continent. This is where the next billion people are coming from over the, up until 2050. So you can only see that this problem is going to become a bigger and bigger problem. Because when you have resources that have value to people, again, whether it's for energy, for protein, for, for land use, when you have resources that, that have value, and if you have a breakdown of governance, law, and order, what happens is people extract that, and you can't expect people to behave irrationally. It's a rational response to a situation. And in our view, that breakdown of governance, law, and order in Africa is the single biggest crisis. And it's a crisis that doesn't just impact wildlife, it's a crisis that impacts people. We'll talk about the solutions uh, uh, just now. So, as a broad set of conclusions, What's going to happen in conservation uh, across the continent? And these are broad conclusions, but I think that they're fair. First of all, protected areas, whether they're national parks, wildlife reserves, what are they formally gazetted as, are going to face a very, very critical period in the coming years. The numbers that are effective, so we're not talking about the areas that are just registered in the IUCN database, but properly managed protected areas, the number are going to decline. You can go country by country, and you can say, that one is gone, that one is gone, that one is gone. 
those that are not being managed will be lost. It's just, it's, it's, uh, it's, uh, it just is illogical to assume that where these areas house these resources that have value to people, if they're not being managed, to, to expect people not to, to be able to utilize them. Unfortunately, as they become scarcer, the costs of protection and of managing them are going to escalate. And then the scarcity, so as there are fewer and fewer of these areas, the scarcity factor starts to kick in. So they become increasingly valuable. And for a group of people that are interested in tourism, I think you're going to find that there's going to be more and more concentration of more and more operations onto these few and fewer areas, and that's not in anyone's, uh, I think, in anyone's interest. And you're going to end up with the overcrowding effect. So, last conclusion, there's a sense of urgency. We've got to do something about this as an international community. Uh, I think that we will reach a new equilibrium. The question is, what will that equilibrium be? Someone referred earlier to the equilibrium, the, the crisis of the 80s, and equilibrium was reached then at a tremendous loss. We will reach an equi equilibrium now. The question is, how many parks protected areas will there be? Okay, so that's a little bit of the, uh, as I said, there were two messages. One was a little bit of the bleak side, then one of hope. And this is where I want to talk a little bit about African parks as, and what we do as an organization. Up until now, national parks and the management of protected areas has been literally the exclusive preserve of governments. Government managed national parks. If the problem is a breakdown of governance, law, and order, then one cannot expect that then the solution is going to come from government. So you've then got to come up with another solution if you want these areas to survive. And that's essentially what African Parks does. So Graham very kindly gave a whole blurb. What do we do? We manage national parks. We do it in terms of a long-term commitment from government. They commit an area to us. We like it ideally for 25 years with a right to renew. We've got one agreement for 50 years with a right to renew. Conservation is a 100-year business. It's not a three-year business or a five-year business. So we get government to commit that park to us. We like to have full responsibility for all actions in it and to be able to counter all threats to it. That's what we call the mandate to manage. Then very importantly, you've got to have strong management mechanisms in place to be able to make sure that having received the mandate, that we do exactly that. We manage this area and, and we look after it. And then thirdly and importantly is to generate the revenue streams supplemented by uh, international funding to be able to make sure that we've got the money necessary to implement the mandate uh, uh, that, we, that we receive. This is a, a little bit of a complex model, but I think it's, it's fairly useful for a lot of you as uh, players in the tourism sector to, to be familiar with. So it's uh, top left-hand corner, government gives to African parks uh, the long-term mandate that we require. What we do with government is we set up a local board uh, registered in the country that we're operating in. We typically control that board, but government can be sitting on it as well together with other uh, key stakeholders. And that's the mechanism that we implement each uh, project through. We appoint the park management, the entire park management team. We focus on skills. We don't, uh, uh, yeah, so it's, uh, our requirement is we put skills in place. Uh, we don't look at necessarily uh, uh, only employing people from the country or only a particular color. Our commitment to government is to look after the national park and conserve it, and we appoint the right people to be able to do that. We as African parks then support our park management teams in everything that they do. Uh, Communities, I'm going to come to that just now as well, a very, very important part of everything that we do, but just a, a minute or two on commercial operators. We haven't got the skills, the expertise, or the capital to do what many of you do. So we like, we, we, we require you, we expect of you to be able to be partners in what we're doing. We will create the product or recreate it if that's necessary. Uh, we will create the investment terms and conditions for you to be able to come and invest in that park, and then we'll make sure that uh, your success is our success. And in doing so, it creates an income for the park. So that bottom uh, right-hand corner is an important part of the overall African parks model. So what do we mean then in terms of pictures? We like to have full responsibility for the law enforcement function. All law enforcement staff are seconded to African parks. We have full uh, management responsibility for them. 
uh, for their work patrols and everything that they do, the type, the type of stuff that Damien was talking about. Anything in terms of quite often a park that we are responsible for has one or more species that are missing in it, and we like to bring everything back, and we like to do that as quickly as possible. So this is not a dead elephant, by the way, for those that are not familiar with it. It's an elephant translocation. So in the case of Majeti, we moved, I think, 250 of them into the park to create the population today of 300. Uh, not just restricted to, to elephant, but obviously to the other species as well. So whatever was there, we like to bring it back again uh, to make sure that the ecosystem is, is functioning properly. There's always a, a large construction component. So if it's things like roads, whether it's from a tourism point of view or from an access to be able to get ranger patrols out there, uh, we take responsibility for that. Any of the construction of staff housing, workshops, uh, telecommunication systems, whatever the park requires to be able to function properly, we put that in place. As I mentioned, the community is an extremely important part of this. If you want a community to value a park, they must, uh, if you want them to conserve it, they must value it. And if they're going to value it, they're going to have to benefit from it. So an important part of every single one of the projects that we run is what we call building a constituency for conservation, making sure that local people understand what you're doing and are benefiting from it so that it is something that they, they support that. And there's no better way, by the way, of doing that uh, than by making sure that people benefit economically. Uh, and that's what we call uh, creating a conservation-led economy. The more people that are employed, the more people that have a micro-enterprise or a stake in this area, uh, the more reason why they will be your constitu uh, constituency for conservation. Then uh, in terms of tourism, so as I mentioned, we would love it if uh, all of you were knocking on the door to come and say we're going to invest in this area. A lot of the areas we are in are difficult, so quite often we need to be able to stimulate tourism to them. Uh, this is a photograph of what we call Camp Nomad in Zakuma National Park. Uh, it is one of the most stunning parks in Africa. Uh, Chad, if you go to the Brat Guide, says Africa for the hardcore. And it is a little bit Africa for the hardcore. Our objective is to make it a safe place for people to be able to come to and to be able to make it easy for uh, people to get there. So this is a Camp, Z uh, Camp Nomad, another photograph. Simple infrastructure, very basic, very comfortable. And we hope that by making investments like this, we can show to people like you that this is something that uh, should be of interest to you. Uh, and I think you're going to hear more and more over time about places like Zakuma. It's only one of the, of the eight that we manage at the moment, uh, but you'll hear more and more of them, I hope, in, uh, in the years to come. Okay, so just that's what we do. A couple of the results, a couple of the things which are, if I say some of the numbers that show what I'm talking about are, are, are real. Uh, this is a, a photograph of, uh, of Liwa Plain in Zambia. When we started the project in 2003, the, uh, the wildebeest uh, migration, the wilde wildebeest uh, movement was about 15,000 animals. As you can see now, by putting proper protection in place, that's moved up to about 45,000. We are busy counting again at the moment. We anticipated being at about 50,000 animals. So that's a three, three and a half fold increase uh, of, that, um, uh, of that population. In addition, we've reintroduced lion, we've reintroduced eland, we've reintroduced buffalo, and all of those populations are thriving. I might add at the same time, as what's been good for conservation and good for the ecology of the area, the murder rate in the Calabo district has gone down from 54 people a year down to zero. So again, what's good for conservation is good for people. Uh, the story of Zakuma. 10 minutes. So the story of Zakuma. Uh, Zakuma, fantastic park in Chad, uh, one which when we started the uh, project in 2011, there were 450 elephant left. Having been at 4,500 elephant in 2004, 2005, somewhere around there. Uh, been completely poached out by the, uh, by the North Sudanese. Because of that, there wasn't a single elephant under the age of five years that was left in the population because the, the females were all, uh, were all aborting or miscarrying. If you look in this picture now, so the numbers, although it doesn't show up so well on the graph just because it's uh, uh, of, the, of the extent where the elephant poaching crisis has come from, 
You can see the numbers there going from 430 to 470. And if I add 2015 to that now, that's probably just on 500 animals. So that population is recovering. We haven't lost a single animal inside the park in the last four years. At the same time, it's something we've been able to bring security, not just to Zakuma, which is 350,000 hectares, but to a 2 million hectare area. Uh, because people that are coming in from North Sudan to poach, don't just poach elephant, they rape, they pillage, and they plunder. So an ele a, a solution for the elephant is a solution for the people. Uh, very quickly, in terms of Akagera National Park in Rwanda, uh, I mentioned about the, the, the revenue generation and the creation of the sustainability. Akagera is a magnificent park. It receives about uh, 30,000 visitors a year, half of which are local Rwandese. They absolutely love this park. Uh, and in doing so, and in being able to capitalize on the income there, uh, we've taken the park from a $200,000 income to a million dollar income. And we hope within the next four years we'll be able to generate sufficient money from the park to be able to wash its face. So this is where we're operating at the moment. The red dots are the, uh, the parks that we are currently managing. There are eight of them. It's about a 5.9 million hectare uh, conservation footprint. The yellow ones are the ones where we are, are fairly advanced in the pipeline and we hope to bring in uh, fairly shortly. And uh, uh, our objective is to be able to get to 20 parks uh, covering approximately 10 million hectares. That's not, a, that's not cast in concrete, but approximately 10 million hectares by 2020. And what we hope in doing that is that despite the fact that the, 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 what I was talking about earlier is a fairly dark picture for conservation as a whole, we hope that as African parks, we can bring a little bit of color to that, uh, to that story. Thank you very much.